Thank you, Brother Denny. That's a great song from, actually, it's in the hymn book as well. But uh, hopefully we'll know that we have been redeemed when we leave this place. Over the next three weeks, uh, well, okay, so starting today, that will be week one, but then two weeks after that, we'll be talking about humble bragging rights. Humble bragging rights. It seems like an oxymoron, uh, humble bragging. But the reality is that those who are humble, who have modeled humility, do have bragging rights to the rest of us. Uh, So I struggle with humility. I know that all of us struggle with humility. And some of you are saying, oh, listen, I don't struggle with humility. Well, you just showed me that you do struggle with humility because you made a prideful statement just in saying that. Each and every one of us struggles with pride. It's the fallen nature of man that naturally propels us to be prideful in all things. You go back to Genesis chapter 3 and you see Adam and Eve in the garden in perfect relationship with one another and with God. And Satan comes to them and says, hey, listen, if you eat of this fruit that God told you not to eat of, you can be like God. And they thought, well, that sounds good. I want to be like God. The problem is, which one of them becomes more like God? Because there can't be any more than one God. So suddenly there's two gods in the garden or semi-gods in the garden. And how do they react to each other? Because the reality is that two prideful people can't exist in the same space for very long without disunity and disharmony defining their relationship. And so throughout the course of human history after that, we have seen time and again the results of pride which lead to disunity and wars and relationship failures, and marriage failures, and all of these kinds of things are a direct result of our inability to be humble before other people. You see, pride begs us to say, look at me, I'm the most important, don't tell me what to do, you can't say that to me, what right do you have to whatever? And we multiply that by 7 billion people on the planet, and there are going to be problems. You see, one day, all of these things will be rectified. The brokenness will be no more. We'll all be unified, and pride will be replaced by perfect humility. And one of the key characteristics of Christ as he walked on earth is humility itself. You see, Christ ushered in the kingdom of God into a society that said, listen, humility is not a virtue. Humility is is for people who are weak and who are slaves and who uh, don't have any power. And Jesus comes in and he ushers in the kingdom of God and he says, humility is the highest of virtues. Humility is what defines who Christ was. You see, he was humble before God and before mankind. And so what we see in the time that we are in today is that from the time of Christ, he ushers in the beginning of his kingdom that we'll see in the fullness, the fullness of the kingdom coming when he comes again. So Christ's example allows us to be able to live in humility today if we're willing to put on the mind of Christ. So for there to be peace among individuals requires humility. For a marriage to work out, it requires humility. And sometimes more grace than you really want to give. I said that in the first service, and I said I wasn't going to say it in the second service, and now I'm afraid to look at Kristen. We'll be married seven years tomorrow. Yeah. I got the better half of the deal. You know, somebody said amen. For a body of believers to be unified requires humility. Requires humility. As we're going to look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. But right before this, Paul's in prison, okay? And uh, he's not in like a gushy prison. I mean, you know, like not one where you get three square meals a day and you get a nice bed of sleep in and you get to go outside and... I mean, you're talking about he's, he's chained to a wall. He's treated like a common criminal. He's in a dirt floor. There's probably rats. And guess what? Where do you go to the bathroom? I mean, it's disgusting. It's, it's a horrific, horrific scene that he's in. And he finds himself in. And yet, 
His attention is not on himself. His, intention, his attention is on the churches that he planted, that he wants to see continue to flourish. He's another example of humility. And so right before the text that we're going to look out today, he says, listen, listen, if there is any of, of the characteristics of Christ among you, if there's any uh, joy, if there is any participation in the spirit, any comfort in love, any affection or sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind and having the same love, being a full accor- in full accord of one mind. So Paul is saying, listen, in order to be of one mind, you need to be humble. You need to be humble and complete my joy by doing so. Because what's his greatest joy? His greatest joy isn't getting out of prison. That would be my greatest joy if I was Paul. I'd be like, get me out of here. Who's going to find some dynamite and blow out this wall so I can get out? Right? But he says, no, complete my joy by being of one mind so that what? The church can carry on making disciples so that the work that he has done was not done in vain. And then he goes on. He says, In uh, verse 3, do nothing out of conceit, uh, rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Listen, you and I don't want to do that at all. We don't want to count others as more significant than ourselves because who's number one? I'm number one. You're number one. But we can't both be number one. And Paul says, don't just be more, uh, don't just be, think of others as significant. Think of them as what? more significant than yourselves think of them as more significant than yourselves the natural default of the human mind and the human heart is to think of self and paul says listen in order to be unified of one mind you must think of others as more important more significant than yourself now listen you you need to look after your own interests but also keep in mind the interests of others so paul is making this plea if you are going to be a unified church humility must define you humility must define each and every individual and he says here is the example and this is where we're going to read today pick up today philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 have this mind amongst yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even, what, death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess uh, in heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord God, we pray that as we look into this text today and we see the example of humility that won our salvation, that we will take to heart uh, the message to be of one mind, a mind unified by humility, whether it's in our workplace, in our marriage, in our relationships, or in our church. God, may we be defined as those who are humble like Christ, who look like Christ, for that is our ultimate aim. And God, may you find us faithful and humble before you. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. This particular section that we're looking at today uh, is likely a hymn that is from the first century church. Uh, This would have predated Paul and his conversion. But basically, they didn't, the majority of people did not know how to read. Uh, You're talking about a society that is not affluent They're not able to read. Most of them aren't able to write. So the way that they teach one another is through songs and hymns and praises. And then, of course, didactically, just just speaking and teaching. And so this uh, this particular set of verses is Paul taking a hymn that predated even his conversion from the church, but is basically a doxology. It just tells about God, who he is. And Paul uses it to fit into his, uh, his explanation of the humility that is required for unity. So I want us to explore the depths of Christ's humility before God and man. 
that's captured in this particular hymn. But in order to be humble before God and man, we must, first of all, have the mind of Christ among us. Have the mind of Christ among us. So we see, first of all, that Jesus is a humble example. Jesus is a humble example. Notice how Paul starts this section off. He says, have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, the key word there is, is. Regardless of what your definition of is, is. It is yours in Christ. Right? And so if we own something already, then we can execute it. But the reality is that having the mind of Christ requires that we do some work with it. The mind of Christ is not something that we earn. It's already ours, but it is something that we need to allow to possess us and that we need to allow to flow from us by engaging in the word of God, by communing with Christ. So although we possess this mind, it doesn't mean that we always use it or that we always know how to use it. To have the mind of Christ, to have the example of humility, to be able to walk in humility requires that we have a relationship with God that is defined upon his word and our time spent with him. You see, Paul writes, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of what? So that you may be able to distinguish the will of God, which is good and acceptable and perfect. The transforming of the mind is the transformation that occurs as we engage with Christ, as we engage in his word. But he says, you need to put on the mind of Christ. You need to reach for the mind of Christ. And so we have to learn to live in the example that Christ sets by pursuing this kind of mind. So the mind of Christ cannot be displayed through a person who doesn't know Christ intimately. You can have the mind of Christ, but not know how to use it. You can know what an engine is in a car, but not know how to fix it. Because you've never read the manual. And so if we're not reading the manual, we can't put on humility. And the inevitable thing that happens is then we don't have the mind of Christ. We're, we're what? We're conformed to the... All right. Yeah, we're conformed to the world. We're conformed to the world. Why? Because we live in the world. And then we're running around, busying ourselves, not pursuing godliness, thinking that we're able to run our own lives. We don't bother with God. And even if we do, we give him lip service. We don't pursue this transformation of the mind. And instead, we see our lives develop into chaos and destruction. And then we go, well, I thought I was a Christian and had the mind of Christ. How am I still, uh, still in this situation? Well, the reason that we're still in that situation is because we're not pursuing the humbleness of mind, the characteristics of God's, of Christ, humility. Humility requires us to work. And I would say even that the humility of Christ is what allowed him to save us. Our salvation hinges on the humility Christ exhibits. Why do I say that? Well, let's look at the next section again. So we're looking at verse 6. It says this, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count himself did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, on a cross. Without Christ's humility, he's not going to the cross. He's not going to obey the Father. You see, that was our mistake. We didn't obey God. We were prideful in our own hearts. Christ is the antithesis, antithesis of who we are. He is humble, not proud before the Father. And what we see is that 
Christ was in the form of God. Now, I don't want you to get the picture that in some way Jesus was like a God. Jesus was an angel. Jesus was created. That's not at all what it's saying. The Greek would show us that when we're talking about the form of God, it means encompassing the fullness of God. It talks about the characteristics, the form, having the form of somebody means inhabiting all of the attributes of the person they're being compared to. And so we're not saying that Jesus was just simply in the form of God. He was kind of a God. He was God himself. And he took on the form of a servant and took on human form. He didn't count equality with God, something to be held on to. So what happens from that humility, from that uh, decision not to hold on to equality with God? He empties himself, humbles himself, becomes obedient to death, even obedient on the cross. So let's just work through this real quick. First of all, when we talk about Jesus being in the form of God, we know from the Apostle John that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was not a God. He was God. The very existence of God. From the beginning, Jesus was the Word. God himself. So everything that's true about God the Father and God the Holy Spirit is true about Jesus. So just so we're clear, in order to rescue a rebellious people, an ungrateful and downright abusive creation, he chose To leave the form of God where he enjoyed the fullness of power and authority and riches and glory and worship day and night. All of the time to take on the form of a servant to be created in the likeness of man. Listen, that's quite a descent. A willful descent. A humble descent. From creator to created. From self-sufficient to... totally reliant upon his mother's blood while he's in a womb to totally reliant upon God to give his human body breath and keep him alive from fully glorified full riches and power in the heavens to being fully immersed in a world that would not receive him would not glorify him would not honor him, would not see him as worthy and he would be comparatively poor this is our christ or should i say this is our christ are you sure because that seems completely backwards from what we would expect He who reigned on high is now a servant of all. And for what? A horrific death on a cross? What kind of foolishness is that? Well, it's foolishness to the world is with the wisdom of God. At least when we look at the cross and we say that's foolishness, we recognize that that's what pride would say. That's what pride would say. Jesus literally owns and sustains all things, and yet he's willing to come and be in the form of a servant. He doesn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself and humbled himself. Now, why would Jesus empty himself and humble himself? Well, he wanted to be obedient to the Father, right? He willfully chose to be obedient to the Father, But when he found himself in human form, what did he recognize? Whose authority was he under? God's authority. You see, he was created in human flesh. His body was fully dependent upon God. He was God and fully man, fully God and fully man at the same time. But while he was here on earth, he was subjected to the Father's will. And so he recognized that his place was not to glorify himself, which he could have if he had not emptied himself. He could have very easily come and said, hey, I'm God and I'm wiping you all out. But that wasn't his decision. That wasn't his uh, to make. It was God's decision to make. And so he empties himself, realizes that he is a servant, not just a servant, but that he's in human form. So he's also not just the servant of God, but what? The servant of mankind. He becomes the lowest of low. You see, he traded a throne for a trough, a crown for a cross, and his glory for shame. So he gave it all up 
in, hum in humility to serve the Father and to serve sinners who were unappreciative and didn't give him any glory. That's the example of humility we have when it comes to how we should live our lives. But listen, it doesn't just stop there. Jesus comes humbly, but he, again, he empties himself. Now, some people will say, well, when God emptied himself, when, when Christ emptied himself, is it hot in here? Dare I? It's warm. The, all the lights are on up here. Russell. <laughs> we had problems with the lights this morning, so we got most of them. Anyway, when people are talking about Jesus emptying himself, a lot of people will think, well, Jesus emptied himself. He was no longer God. But that's not what the Bible tells us, that when Jesus came, he was fully God and fully man. And so when we're talking about emptying himself, we're talking about the fact that he decided on his own, by his own humility, to restrict his right to use his God given abilities, his God abilities, while he was here on earth in submission to the Father. So it wasn't something that he was like no longer God. It was that he had all of the rights of God. He just chose on our behalf and in humility to the Father not to exercise those while he was on earth. So don't be thinking that, well, now he wasn't God because it required two parties to be present on the cross in order for us to be saved. Those who needed to be saved, which would have been Christ and his human body, and then God himself, who kept the human from sinning so that he may be a perfect sacrifice and offer forgiveness to us. For there is no forgiveness of sins without the remission of blood. And the remission of blood required a perfect sacrifice, an unblemished sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is fully man and fully God. I know that's a deep and weird theological thing and it blows a lot of people's minds. But that's the reality. Jesus himself was God even while he was here on earth, but he decided not to use those qualities for his benefit. And while we're talking about humility, we see that the example of humility that he presents to us is also an example of what it means to be humble. So we also see a Christ who is uh, humble in his obedience. A humble obedience is the second point up there. See, Jesus' life is not just an example it's the way that you and I are to relate to God. You see, you and I love to tell God what we want to do. Whether that's what we want to do for work, uh, how we raise our families, what we do with our finances, how we serve in the church, whether or not we like our pastors, uh, ministry, missions, or even naps. We love to tell God what we're going to do. And we say, listen, when I occasionally check in with God, that's what we're really talking about is this obedience to God. I occasionally check in and make sure we're kind of on the same page. But that's not what Christ, that's not what Christ did. God, Christ constantly communed with God. So in order to have one mind and to have the mind of Christ requires humble obedience. A humble obedience that says, God, no matter what you have in store for me, I believe that you have what's best. And that no matter what that looks like, I am willing to continue to follow you. And listen, humble obedience is always rewarded. Always rewarded. Maybe not in the way we think it should be, but it is always rewarded. But you have to figure, Jesus' humility took him where? To the cross. That doesn't seem very rewarding. But for some reason, Christ is propelled to do that. Why? Because he's living in the will of the Father through humble obedience to the Father. He says his love for the Father and his desire to walk humbly before him and to rescue humanity, to be humble before humanity, allow them to spit upon him, destroy him, kill his mortal body, and in this heinous death, he says, I'm going to obey because... I know the will of the Father, and I'm willing to humbly obey, even if it costs me my life. Jesus was not just humble. He was humiliated before his creation. Those he spoke into existence saw his naked body hanging on a cross. You see the pictures where they, he has the cloth? No, that's not what happened. They took the cloth off. 
fully exposed and humiliated, spat upon, beaten, nailed to a cross, raised in the air for everyone to see his shame. The Jews saw him and they thought, Deuteronomy 21 says anyone who hangs from a tree is accursed by God. The Romans said this is the punishment that is reserved for the most heinous of criminals. Look, he's between two criminals. He must have done something horrible. The Father, God the Father, looks down and he says, you're guilty even though you're innocent because you are taking on the sin. He became sin who know no sin. Even though he's innocent, he is following through on the Father's plan. And it was the Father's uh, desire and pleasure to crush him for an ungrateful humanity. That requires humility. That's your Christ. The Christ who gave up the cross, gave up the throne for a cross. The mind of Christ was focused solely on serving others and serving God. It wasn't on uh, gaining anything but obeying. Not on elevating himself, but on serving. Though equality with God was something that we desired, it was only the humility of Christ that allowed our salvation to be able to be available to us. It's interesting that Jesus allows himself to be humiliated on the cross. You see... In obedience to the Father, in humble obedience to the Father, he was willing to allow the Father to dictate the time, the place, and the method of his execution. And he did it without uttering a word of protest. This part of the hymn gives us a clear view of the power of humility before God and others. As he said before, Paul's plea prior to this is that the Philippians would be of one mind, that they would be unified. He basically begged them, make my joy complete. Consider the circumstances I'm in. Make my joy complete. Be of one mind, guarding yourself against selfish ambition and pride. Be humble. And in case you forgot what that looks like, he says, look at the life of Christ, the pinnacle of humanity of humility and the emptying of himself was his complete obedience to death, even death on an inglorious cross. Now, we remember that he says, it says that he was in the form of God, that he emptied himself, that when he found himself in human form, he humbled himself to the will of God. And so we go from this great glory to this great shame. And the cross is the end of Christ's journey on earth as a human being that is humbled before God, before his exaltation. It is the complete opposite of what he had in heaven, and yet he was willing to bear it. That's why it says he was willing to be obedient to death. Well, great, he was wi willing to be obedient to death, but death on a cross? Something humiliating and shameful? That obedient? Does that define our lives? Is that somewhere you're willing to go or I'm willing to go to be obedient to the Father or to serve others? Is that somewhere that we are willing to take ourselves to put on the mind of Christ, to study his word, and to understand that in all humility we are to serve others, even those we don't like? Even those we don't like? Believe it or not, Every single one of us have people we don't like. You know what the root of that is? Pride. It's pride. Because it says, I'm better than you. So in order to affect change in other people's lives, in order to reveal the heart of Christ, in order to reveal the heart of God, means that we must die to ourselves, just as Christ was willing to put away all of the trappings of, of being God in order to humble himself before God so that God can shine through us. God can shine through us. God cannot shine through those who are proud. But he can shine through those who are humble. I was thinking about the fact that many of us 
forget that as we are walking our Christian lives, that other people are watching. That other people are watching. That we, our lives are a testimony to other people. So if we live our lives in pride, or we're unwilling to be uh, servants of others, then people look at us and they say, is your Christ like that too? Well, the answer is no. Our Christ isn't like that. And so then we see churches that are falling apart because a few people are grabbing power, whether that's a pastor who's been there 25 years or a church council that doesn't want to let their pastors lead and all of the infighting and the people from the outside go, is that how your Christ was? Because it doesn't look any different than the business that I'm running. You see, the health of a church, the health of relationships require that every single person be willing to humble themselves, to take a step back, and to recognize others as more significant than themselves. And the reality of that is that the blessings for that humility are not just ours, but those blessings of our humility flow out to other people, just as the blessing of the cross flowed out from Christ. His humility is what led to our salvation. We benefited from what he was willing to do for each and every one of us to the glory of God the Father through his humility. Can you imagine how different the world would be if the church, even just the church, modeled that kind of humility to the world. Now I'll tell you, this church is the best church I've ever served in. I love the people. I, the grace of God, I believe, has blessed this church. The spirit of God is on this church, moves in and through this church. It takes one person to destroy that. You might be thinking, well, Pastor Josh, why are you preaching about pride and humility as it relates to the church and those kind of things? We must always be on guard. It takes one person not to be in the mind of Christ, to be conformed to the world, to destroy the unity that we see in this church today. I've seen it time and again Somebody gets hacked because the pastor doesn't go the direction they think they should or they don't value a ministry the way that somebody else thinks they should. And before you know it, there's a faction over here and a faction over there and the church crumbles. That's not of Christ. It is Satan's job to destroy churches. He desires to see people be prideful. It was his first sin as well. I'm going to be God. That's what he wanted. And so churches fall apart because of people's prideful hearts. So in humility, in humility, may we all be willing to serve one another. I will say this, that with Pastor Frank not here, there is always the danger that someone's going to get the bright idea to try to do something. That the devil is going to try to infiltrate somebody's heart with pride. Don't. That's not of Christ. That will not meet a good end. Be humble. The final thing that we see is a humble boast. This is where things get exciting. Really exciting says this, therefore, and anytime you see therefore, you know, what's it there for? What we just talked about, Christ's obedience and humility. God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and, and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in case you were reading this section before and you're like, it is horrible that God uh, made his son go through this. First of all, God didn't make Jesus do anything. He willingly submitted to the Father in humility to rescue sinners like you and me. What the world saw as foolishness and death and destruction was not foolishness to the Father, uh, to the Father, to God. It was the greatest comeback story in all of history. The one and only Jesus Christ walked out of the grave. 
and return to the Father because his love for the Father and his willingness to be humble before the Father propelled him, propelled him to be obedient. He rose from the dead. And the Father was faithful. Why? Because Jesus was true humanity. What you and I were created to be. What does that mean? We were created to be perfect. To commune with Christ. To commune with God. To know God. To grow in God. To be obedient to him. And he says, here are the rewards. And we see the greatest reward here is that Jesus, the true humanity, rises up and God exalts him and bestows upon him the name that is above every other name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Where the world would reject Christ, the Father restored Christ to his former glory. And some people believe that the Father elevated him even higher, if that were even possible. So ultimately, Jesus did not force his way to receive the highest name. He willingly submitted and then submitted to the Father's prerogative to elevate his name. You see, it was the complete opposite of what the disciples were asking Jesus to do while they were on earth, right? They're like, hey, these two guys walk up to Jesus. They throw their arm around and like, hey, Jesus, let's have a talk while the other ten disciples are back there. Can you make it so one of us sits at your right hand and one of us sits at your left hand uh, when your kingdom comes? And Jesus says, what? The authority to do that is not of mine, it's the Father's. You see, Jesus could have tried to exalt himself and, and push his way through, but that's humanity. That's pride. Jesus says, I'm leaving that up to the Father. It is the Father's prerogative whether to elevate me or not. But my call right now is to be obedient to him. And he put his trust in the Father. And what we see is that any time that we are willing to be humble before God, we will be rewarded. Maybe not this side of eternity. Because the majority of us, if not all of us, if we're nailed to a cross, we ain't coming back right away. But we're not storing up treasures on earth. We're treasuring up we're, we're treasuring we're storing treasures in heaven thank you it's 11:44 i've been up since like 5 so i, I don't want you to get the picture that just because you're obedient this side of eternity that you're going to get something that's well that's heresy and that is prosperity gospel. If you're doing things in order for you to get things, that's not what the gospel is about, okay? That's ridiculous. The gospel is so much more than that. And if that's your idea of the gospel, you are not saved. You're lost. Because the idea of the gospel is you're a sinner in need of a savior who has rescued you from the sins and who has called you to be obedient to him. Who, who you have said, I'm going to give my lordship uh, over to the right of my life over to and if he decides to bless me with things that's great but that's not what we're pursuing what we're pursuing is what the glory of god notice how the text ends that every tongue confess that jesus is lord to the glory of god the father it is from the father that jesus receives uh, glory but ultimately all glory belongs to god the father himself so we're going to see one day all knees bow to Jesus Christ. Listen, nobody in human history will ever see every single knee bow in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, except for Jesus Christ to them, to him. I don't care what president, emperor, or king may be, dictator, they will never see every knee bow. That alone belongs to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will see that happen. Because it is already made certain by God. He said, here is the reward for your obedience. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of 
God the Father. The ultimate of humility will be that we will bow the knee to Jesus Christ, who was humble on our behalf and humble to the Father. Listen, I don't know where you are in your own Christian walk. Maybe you haven't even started your Christian walk. The reality is that the first step of becoming a believer in Christ requires humility, where you come to God and you say, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I can't save myself. I've rebelled against you. There is nothing that, you, that I can do to make it up to you. So I'm coming to you in humility, recognizing that you are the penultimate of holiness and that I am a sinner in need of a savior and that Jesus Christ died for me and he is the only way. That's the gospel message in itself. Humility says, I rebelled against you and I need help. And we turn our lordship, the right to rule our lives, over to him. You see, anybody can just come and say, Jesus is Lord, right? I mean, you don't have to have the spirit just to utter those words, to really mean it, to really turn a life over and say, Jesus is Lord requires the Holy Spirit and a humble heart that says, I'm willing to do whatever Jesus tells me to do. We turn our lordship over to him. We come to him in humility and say, we don't know what's best for our lives. I don't don't know how best to do this. All I know is that Jesus Christ saved me and God has a better plan for my life and I'm willing to submit to whatever that plan is. Maybe God is calling you to something today and you're like, I'm not doing that because I have to give up my comforts. I might have to leave my family I would lose all of my retirement, whatever it might be. I'll lose my free time. God, I'm not doing that. Then you're not walking in the lordship of Jesus Christ. You're not walking in humility. You don't have the mind of Christ on you. Get in the word. And what you'll see is that the things that you value are far less than the things that God has in store for you. The blessing of knowing him. And maybe you're a Christian and you struggle with pride. Maybe some of you are sitting out there today And you're crossing your arms and you're saying, everybody else needs to hear this message, but not me. Well, that one's for you. Sometimes it's just more subtle. Sometimes it's, I'm glad I'm not that guy. That's not the mind of Christ. That's not the mind of Christ. We we all struggle with pride. It's the default of humanity. But our redemption was made possible through, our, through the humility of Jesus Christ. Pursue that. Pursue that. <laughs> you know, it's funny to even think that we have to talk about this. Because to be prideful would say to us that we in some way have some control or power over our lives. When ultimately God has all control and power over our lives and could wipe us all out in an instant. Isn't that bizarre? How can we help but not be humble before God? How much like Christ are you today? Have you put the mind of Christ on? Are you pursuing the mind of Christ? Are you pursuing the oneness of mind with the church and with others around you? Are you sitting back with critical spirit? Are you sitting back and saying, I would do this differently? Our call is to be obedient like Christ. The greatest rewards come from following him. And so today you get to make that choice. Am I going to follow Christ? Am I going to follow his example? Am I going to learn from Philippians 2? Or am I going to continue to walk in this and hope that my own life turns out okay? It won't. It won't. And you won't influence others for the glory of God, which is our highest call. To glorify God. In all that we do. Over the next two weeks, we'll be finishing up. We'll be continuing this series. Next week, we're going to talk about the love that overflows out of humility for believers and for other people. And then the last week, we're going to talk about the fact that Paul goes on in chapter 3 to talk about all the things that he has done. All the things that he has done as a Jew that would make him righteous in front of God and in front of man. He says, but listen, I count all of that as lost for knowing Christ. You can do all the work. 
You can act like you have it all together. You can try to work your way to heaven. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Bowing the knee to him and saying, I give it all to him. I give my life to him. And I love him. And I'll cherish him. And I will glorify the Father in my life. Is that where you are today? That's where we all need to find ourselves. God, I thank you for today. I thank you that your hand of mercy and grace and love is upon us. Oh, God, we find ourselves prideful all the time. Whether it's uh, prideful towards you or prideful towards other people. But God, may that pride be uh, eliminated through our spending time with you and your word, getting to know you, growing in you, and seeking to have a mind, the mind of Christ. God, we do thank you that we're able to be in a church where there is unity. But Lord, we know how, how, uh, how precious that unity is and how fragile it can be at times. Lord, I pray that your spirit will just fall upon us, that as we're seeking to be humble before you, that your name uh, will be proclaimed not just in our lives, but in our hearts each and every day, that we will seek to glorify you in unity uh, and humility. God, I pray that we'll pursue a godly character. God, during this time, um, I ask that you'll be moving in our midst, moving in the hearts of those who may feel pride. God, breaking down the barriers that keep us from you, that you may be glorified. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Russell. That's a great, great song. We are redeemed. You know, I was looking out over the uh, congregation this morning. There are a lot of tired teens here today. And maybe a tired youth and student pastor. Student and youth pastor. You might actually be asleep. Are you asleep? Yeah, that's what I thought. They just got back from a mission trip. Um, they, pastor Jeff and maybe some of the kids will be sharing some more about that next week. Give them a chance to recover and figure out what they want to talk about. Um, but uh, so grateful that to all of you who have been praying, who gave, um, and who went uh, on this mission trip. What a great uh, show of unity in the church and a great opportunity for these young people to uh, share Christ and to be able to go. So thank you all for the support. Um, okay, last week we started a series called Humble Bragging Rights, and everybody looked at me like I had three heads because it didn't make any sense. Uh, humble Bragging Rights, so that's okay. Um, next week you'll understand why. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's called Humble Bragging Rights because that will actually be the title of the message. Um, but uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, unity. Um, we, last, last week we talked about uh, the humility of Christ, the humility of Christ. And we looked at a hymn that's found in Philippians chapter 2, uh, basically that showed us the reality of who Christ is, the, what he had done on our behalf, and the humility that it took for him to leave heaven, to come down to rescue us from our sins, to be obedient to the Father with whom he is an equal, and not only that, but to be the servant of all, to make himself the lowest of lows, even amongst us, in order that we may be saved. And we talked about the fact that um, Paul, in particular, is talking to the Philippians um, about unity. And he's talking about unity uh, being made possible through humility. And so he uses the example of Jesus' life. And his humility to show us exactly how we should live in order to protect the unity that is inside of the church. Apparently, as Paul is in prison, uh, he has come to recognize or come to hear that the church of Philippi is struggling. They're having a hard time. There is a lot of disunity inside of the church. And this is a toxic disunity that he's concerned that will distract them from the message of the gospel. That will, that will keep them from being able to be a light in a dark world. He has some very pointed corrections throughout this book. And he also names two particular people who may, some uh, believe, are the ringleaders of this disunity. Judea uh, and oh, Syntyche. Sorry. Um, but the issues of unity don't end there. He talks about the issues of unity regarding himself. Uh, some of the people feel like uh, Paul has come, 
He's left. He didn't tell them all about the suffering that they would go through. And they're like, how could you leave us and we're suffering? And so they're angry at Paul. The, he, he's not present. And so they're also angry at some of the leaders that are there that are um, also uh, being persecuted and uh, leading the church uh, in sharing the gospel and all of these things. And they're saying, listen, we don't like the decisions you're making. And then, of course, there is the infighting between the different groups in the church, in between two people, and the fact that they're facing persecution is just they're just tired they're tired they're worn out and they want they want to somehow figure out how to get past all of this and paul's prayer is that listen you need to be focusing on the kingdom of god not on yourselves you need to be humble it's interesting that in response to their complaining and grumbling about paul he says i don't know where you think i am but i'm not in the hilton here like i'm in prison I'm suffering alongside of you. And as I'm suffering alongside of you, don't forget this. Don't forget this. In suffering, the gospel is proclaimed. The gospel is expanded. The kingdom of God is expanded through suffering. So suffering is a blessing. Don't look at it as a curse. Don't blame me for suffering. Have an internal perspective. So that's Paul's message to them. Stop complaining and destroying the unity that, that, uh, that is around yourself. But come, come together. Come together to do the work of God and his good pleasure that he's called you to do. And so as we look at the next set of verses, which will be Philippians 2, verses 12 through 18, we're going to look for some practical ways that Paul tells the church, this is how you remain unified. This is how you remain unified as you live in the world, as you're facing persecution, as you're suffering, as you're arguing with each other, which you shouldn't be doing. This is how you remain unified. This is how you recapture the unity that you are losing. See, unity in the body of Christ is precious, but it's also fragile. If we really think about it, the reality is that there is a darkness led by Satan himself that is trying to overcome the power of God, the power of the gospel and the churches all throughout the world. And so there is no easier way for Satan to destroy the mission of a church than to infiltrate somebody on the inside to cause disunity and do his work for him. And Paul doesn't want to see that happen. He's like, he's like listen, you are a light of the world. You can't be darkness. This is dangerous. We need to be careful here. Unity is precious, but it's also fragile. So today, we're going to take some of the same principles we see in this text and apply it to our church as well. So if you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, we're going to look at Philippians 2, 12 through 18. Philippians 2, verses 12 through 18. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my, in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you are as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ... I may be proud that I did not run in vain, even though I, am poor, I may be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. God, we thank you that we're able to uh, hear your word, to apply it to our lives. And I pray that as we look at unity and humility today, that our hearts will be uh, open to that. That if there are places where we feel convicted, that we will answer that and that we will repent of that and turn away. If there are places uh, in relationships that we need to repair, I pray that we will be willing to do that as well. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. The first point uh, that we see in this text is that there is unity through humble obedience. Unity through humble obedience. I like the way that Paul starts off this particular passage. He says what? My beloved, right? Those whom I love, those whom I care for, those whom I desire to see the best for, those who I desire to see Christ fully developed in. He doesn't just start off with complaints, right? He reestablishes the fact that, listen, I've been with you for several years. You are my beloved. I love you. I care about you. I want what's best for you. Please hear that before I start telling you 
the things that I need you to do to unify the church once again. And so he has a great desire. But how many of us, how many of us never, don't really have that desire? We just kind of want to meddle in somebody else's business. Be like, you shouldn't be doing that. And they're like, who the heck are you? You just met me five minutes ago, right? Or we have, we see something in the church that we don't particularly like about a church member. And we'll go over and we'll talk to them. And they're like, you don't really have a right to say that to me because I don't even know who you are. Paul's not starting from that point. The best place to start in correcting someone is in a relationship with that person. It's not going to go well if you are not affiliated in a relationship with that person. It just doesn't go well. In fact, they're much more likely to punch you in the face. They don't want to hear it. You don't have a relationship with them. It's hard enough to correct somebody when you are in a relationship with them. Because there's always this subtlety inside of our inside of our minds this subtle thought that well maybe this person doesn't have what's best in mind for me and so we think i'm just going to kind of come back out swinging because i I don't know if i can really trust this person paul paul doesn't address the philippians like that he's listen you are my beloved i care for you deeply i care for the mission of god deeply and he expresses his love and concern in fact philippians is called the love letter it is paul's love letter to this church it is full of love that he just exudes and so the first thing that we see in this text is he he compliments them he says as you have always obeyed so now not only in my presence but much more in my absence as you have always obeyed He says, you are my beloved, and as you have always obeyed. Why are they his beloved? Because they have always obeyed Christ. They've always obeyed the teachings that he has brought. And so Paul knows this church is starting from a good place. They have a good foundation. He has been there. He has taught them. He has seen the reality of their salvation. He has seen that God is willing and working in and through them. And he doesn't want them to lose that. He wants them to be able to continue to pursue the call of Christ, to pursue the lost, and to live in the light of the gospel. And he says, listen, you have obeyed me when I'm here, even much more now in my absence. Even much more now in my absence. Now, how many of you uh, went to school? All right. How many of you had substitute teachers? Yup. Yup. How was the behavior when the substitute was there? Yeah, yeah. Paul was there, right, with the Philippians. He taught them. He helped them come along. He taught them all the things of Christ. And then suddenly, what? He leaves, but he leaves in charge other people, right? They're like, well, you're the substitute. We don't have to listen to you. But Paul is saying in this text, he says, you have always obeyed much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He is saying, in my absence, you are ultimately not obedient to me. You are obedient to the one to whom I've pointed you. He says, you are to be obedient ultimately to Yes, Christ. We do a little bit of Q&A here. are ultimately obedient to christ so whether paul's here or whether paul's not here it doesn't matter you're called to be we're called to be obedient they're called to be obedient does this apply to us at all today well i'm preaching here today and pastor frank is not here because he's on sabbatical but whether he's here or whether he's not we obey christ Because our obedience to Christ and our obedience ultimately to Christ, but through Pastor Frank, is to be obedient to the rulers and the leaders that he has put in our church. So some people may get the bright idea. I have not heard this yet. We've still got a month. I haven't heard it yet. But some people might get the idea, Satan may enter their heart and say, you know, while he's gone, I should try to get this done. Or I'm going to really let people know how I feel about this or this or this. Can I tell you, first of all, that's going to destroy unity. Secondly, Paul says, whether I'm there or absent, you need to be obedient. So whether Pastor Frank's here or not, 
We're still under his authority, his God-given authority, that he has placed Pastor Frank here in this church to lead us. We are still to be obedient to him. And if that's not enough, if we go over to uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 13, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who give an account. Now, I have been in churches, I've even been a leader in a church, where it seems like the congregation and the leaders were at odds because neither one of them trusted that the other one had the best interest for the church in mind or for the other people in mind. But according to Hebrews 13, it says, submit to your leaders as those who give an account. A good leader recognizes that they will ultimately give an account for every single sheep that enters their church. Pastor Frank is one of those pastors. He has a heart for the church. There are pastors that don't have a heart for the church, but the reality is he recognizes that he will give an account And he has your best interests in mind. So whether he's here or whether he's not, we obey him. And ultimately, by obeying him, we're obeying Christ. Yes. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Paul basically is telling, listen, just because I'm not there doesn't mean you stop obeying Christ. Because it's not ultimately about me. It's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. The church's mission. The church's Devotion to the one who died for them. That's what it's all about. Now, I use the ESV. Some people use the NIV, the nearly inspired version. (laughs) But it actually has a better rendering of this text. It says, continue, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling or all in submission, depending. Continue. So some people will read that and be like, what does it mean that I have to work out my salvation with fear and trembling? Well, in the context, it says, listen, I've already seen that you are saved because you always obey. Continue in that. Continue being obedient. Continue following Christ. Continue to reveal that you are saved. In that way, you will know that God is working in and through you to do his good will and his good pleasure. Look what it says. Excuse me. In verse 13, uh, right before that it says, Work out or continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work. For his good pleasure. The reality of our salvation as a church and as a, an individual is that we have a desire in our heart that God has produced in us to will and to work on his behalf. And so if we don't experience that, uh, that willingness, that desire to serve God in his kingdom, well then we have to wonder whether or not we're actually a part of that kingdom. Because the natural response of a person who loves God is this. Who is like my God? Who can deliver my soul? The source of all living things. The one on whom I fully rely. The one who gives me breath. The one who gives me desire. How can we not come before him and bow in obedience to him and give our lives to him and see that his good will and pleasure is done in and through us? That's ultimately the call that we have when we come to Christ. It's not to fulfill ourselves and to say, look how great I am. It's to say, I am here to expend my entire life to do his good will and pleasure, which he enables me to do and wants me to do. And because of my relationship with him, I am willing to do it. Basically, he's like, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. The second point that we see here is that there there is unity through purity. Unity through purity. Look at verse 14. This is one of those foot-crushing sessions. Do all things without grumbling or questioning. (laughs) That you may be blameless and innocent children without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, basically complaining, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God. What other nation was called the children of God? 
Israel. Right, so the Hebrews are, they're, they're released from Egypt, right? God rescues them miraculously from Egypt, and they make it like 30 feet across the Red Sea, and they're like, Moses, did you bring us out here to die? That's the complete opposite of what God was establishing this nation to do. He wasn't establishing this nation just to uh, get out of Egypt. He was establishing this nation to be something, to represent him, to glorify him, to show him as holy, to give him all of the honor and the glory and the worship that he deserves and to be the light of the world. Guess who else is called to do the same thing? The church. The church. But did you know that as they were going through the desert, which took 40 years because, well, they made bad decisions like we all do, that there were times where God killed a whole bunch of them because they grumbled and complained against their leaders. Because God took it as a personal affront to what? His rulership. They were, they, you might, might be complaining about rulers about the people that were in charge but ultimately god says if you're complaining about the people that i've put to lead you you're ultimately rebelling against my leadership and so we see korah this this small clan of hebrews they come to moses and aaron they're like well look you got us this far but who made you in charge God says, separate yourselves from the rest of us and let's see. And guess what? The ground opens up and swallows them all in all of their possessions. Another time, the people are grumbling against Aaron and uh, Moses and Aaron. And God's, uh, the cloud falls upon the tent of meeting. Moses and Aaron go there and they plead before God not to obliterate the, uh, the Hebrews. And they come out and there's 14,000 people dead from a plague. God takes it very seriously that when we place our hope and our life in Jesus Christ, when we come together as a church, that we shine as a light that glorifies him. And so he wants to make sure that we understand, even from the example of the Israelites, that we are to be a light, not a people who are defined by grumbling and complaining. Now, I've been in churches all my life, and some of you will be saying, well, Pastor Josh, you just don't understand church politics and all these things. I'll say, here's my 35-year membership card. I was born on June the 4th and in church June the 8th. I mean, come on. I've been here for 35 years. I know how churches work. Let me tell you that any time that I have seen uh, a church, any time I've seen grumbling and complaining in church, it has never ended well. First of all, guess what? Nobody wants to hear your grumbling and complaints. I say that in love. Secondly, listen, listen to me. Listen. Your grumbling and complaints draw other people's attention to the problems in the church or the problems that you have and away from their relationship with Jesus Christ. It can also lead to a complete distraction from the expansion of God's kingdom, from our very mission. Crumbling and complaining can draw people away from the very reason for which we exist It introduces a sinful element into the body of Christ that leads to eternal consequences. Listen, grumbling and complaining are the opposite of what God would say are children of God. Children of God are defined by the precious blood of Christ, committed to live like him in humility, strive uh, for unity, love neighbors, think of others as more insignificant than themselves. Grumbling and complaining reveals discontent, which drives to disunity, but ultimately, guess who your discontent is with? Not with the people that you're disgruntled with. Ultimately, you're talking about that you're disgruntled with God himself and those he's put in your life. That's a dangerous place to be. And then you add to the fact that if we continue in that way, that the church is disunified, not only are you coming against God, you are also destroying the mission that he has placed inside the church. You cannot be a children, a child of God and a child of the world. We have to pick. That's why we have to guard ourselves when we feel like grumbling and complaining. 
to, it only takes one or two people or a small group of people to come together to say, uh, I don't like a decision that was made. I don't like a leader. I don't like a teacher. I don't like a pastor. I don't like uh, the way that the, the music goes. I don't, you know, whatever it might be. We can all get angry about anything. I mean, I have seen outright arguments inside of churches where the love of Christ is obviously not there. But I've also seen more sinister and more secretive things where you walk into a room and there's a small group of people talking in the corner, in a dark corner. And then they see you and they stop talking. I've seen people invite others to their homes to try to figure out a way to get rid of a pastor. I mean, there are sinister things that we do. All of these things sow disunity. They don't just sow disunity, they sow distrust. Distrust ultimately so is disunity as well. So whether you're in a Sunday school class and complaining about something or uh, inviting people to your home to complain or in a restaurant uh, where you're trying to find like-minded people that might agree with you, disunity will reign. And it's dangerous to the unity of the, Christ, uh, of the, of the church. You see, complaining and grumbling is ultimately a cancer that eats at the heart the soul, and the mind of the church and spreads everywhere. You might think it's not a big deal. But listen, one cancer cell can multiply into, metastasize into your whole body and kill it. I've seen it happen. And do you realize that complaining does irreparable eternal damage? That it reflects to others who don't believe in God if you're out talking about your pastor or about other members of your church and non-believers hear that? They are not drawn to Christ. They are drawn away from Christ. That's a dangerous place to be, folks. There are eternal consequences for the things that we do and the things that we say, and we must be careful for the unity of the church and ultimately to see other people come to Christ. The Bible, uh, the Bible says this in Ephesians. Paul says this in Ephesians. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up of others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. If somebody needs Jesus Christ, we can't have unwholesome talk about fellow believers come out of our mouths in their presence. We have to be careful. Listen, our job is not to get a selfish, selfish message out or to have our desires heard. It's to proclaim Christ to a lost and dying world. If we forget that we, are, uh, that we are called for a specific purpose, our hearts will be captured with self-interests, self-desires, and we will not be expanding the kingdom of God. A heart that is captured by God should ooze praise for him and a message that Christ saves to all believers. It should define our lives. The only thing that will never fail is the promises of Christ, the promises of God that we can hold on to forever. It is through his spirit that we are able to be unified, but, but just as so many other things that we have to do, we have to be a willing participant in that. Be renewed through the renewal of our minds. Now, listen, I understand that there are some legitimate concerns. I've had legitimate concerns with uh, a pastor that I worked with, and then I didn't work there much longer. Um, it was um, The things he was doing was unbiblical. That's where we draw the line, folks. Okay, we might not agree with the decision that's made. We might not like the way that Pastor Jeff does his hair. Welcome back, buddy. I missed you. It's like, you know, um, David and Jonathan, two souls knit together. That's like Pastor Jeff and me. He's like my brother. He is. Um, we complain about all those kind of things, but... You know, the reality is that most of those things don't matter for eternity. If you have a problem with somebody, what does the Bible say to do? Does it say to, says to pray for them? It doesn't say 
call your closest friends and talk about how much you hate them? That's happened before. It doesn't say go and talk about the decisions that you disagree. It says go and talk to them. Why? Because we have the best interest of each other in mind. We're one in Christ. Christ is humble. We should all be humble. Humility means receiving that kind of uh, criticism, correction. It also means being willing to go to a person saying, I'm humble enough not to talk behind your back, but to love you and the unity of the church and our unity together to go to you, even if it's really uncomfortable, which it is many times. Many, many times. So we have to be careful. We We have to recognize what's simply our opinion that could take away from kingdom work or what really is taken away from kingdom work that needs to be addressed. Two very different things. Opinions in the light of eternity. Oh, guess what? You ain't going to be here forever. The kingdom of God will reign forever. Where's our focus? Where's our focus? Where is the focus to remain pure? Because we have to remember that the way that we live is look, the world is watching us. Are we a witness to God or a witness away from God? Let's be blameless before them. The final thing that I want to point out is that we must be unified for the prize. Unified for the prize. Listen, this is not all in vain. I was listening to the radio today. Um, I listened to NPR just to find out what the, well, I was going to say crazies are saying, but some of the stuff is all right. Some of the other stuff is way out there. Today there was a particle physicist on there and uh he said, we have to look at everything, like take the whole scope, not just of physics, but of like science and psychology and, um, and uh, spirituality and see that through particle physics and how all of these particles have come together to get us to the point where we're rational human beings. And then and only then do we find the, our own purpose, which is inside of ourselves. And I was like, that is the stupidest bunch of horse manure I have ever heard in my life. We're not running in vain. We have a purpose. We were created by God to glorify and to love him and expand his kingdom all over the earth. Then we screwed it up. Then he picks a a, a nation. He pulls them through. They screwed it up. And then he says, I'm going to send my son because apparently I'm the only one that can do this. And he comes and he rescues us and we still screw it up. But thankfully, we have a savior who's willing to save us no matter what. And he says, you need to be united in me for the prize because the prize is far greater than anything that you can receive this side of eternity. You have a purpose, you have a meaning, you have a love, and ultimately you will be with your greatest joy, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All of the things that we put in front of the, of the kingdom of God are meaningless. I think if we put it this way, if our mouths were more full of praise and adoration and encouragement and less and more full of the word of life, I think there'd be a lot less people spending an eternity in hell. And there'd be a lot less churches closing their doors. Listen to what Paul says, verse 15 uh, and 16. Hang on a second. There it is. In the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Can you imagine being Paul, living in prison right now, and thinking, if this church falls apart, I labored in vain? What if I labored in vain? Oh, he wants to be proud. He wants to be proud when he stands before Christ, not because of what he did, but because of what Christ has done through him and is doing all throughout Philippi. He is encouraging them, listen, don't just do it on my behalf that I can brag before God about what I did, but let me be able to get to heaven and to say, look at what God did. Look at what I have to present to you, the work that I've been able to do. How terrible would it be for us to get up to heaven and not have anything to present to God? What would you do with the salvation and the knowledge of salvation that you had? Nothing. Paul's literally saying right here that his greatest desire is to present them to God, to be proud that he didn't run in vain, that God may be glorified in all that he did. And he says in this, in verse 17, even if I am poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, 
not his own faith, of their faith. He is willing to die on their behalf so that God is glorified in his life and through that church. Now the question is, how many of us are willing to pour out a a drink offering, a sacrifice of ourselves to ensure the unity of this church? How many of us are willing to be humble enough like Christ to submit ourselves to God to say, listen, I know that I am a sinner who needs a savior who has a propensity to want to let everybody know my disgruntlement. But because I love the church and because I love the body of Christ and because I love Christ himself, I am willing to put all of those things aside so that when I get to heaven, I can present myself to Christ and rejoice that I was a part of the work here at Paramount Baptist Church and beyond. He says, I am glad to be poured out as a sacrifice. Wow. The man's in prison. And his words are still, I am proud. I am proud to be poured out as a sacrifice. He says, and likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. Why should they be glad and rejoice with them? With him. Because they are all striving to the same prize. They should be glad because they are headed for an eternity with God. An eternity that is available to you and to me and to every single person who receives Jesus Christ. The forgiveness that he offers through the love of the Father. Listen, I know humility is hard. I know it's difficult to not take your frustrations out and give them to other like-minded people to try to take control of situations or argue about things that we're passionate about. That's what grumbling and complaining is. It's a natural default in us. But if Christ reigns and he lives in us and we are called to be the word of life, we live in the word of life and we carry the word of life, not the word of self. Paul expects the church to be on mission for Christ, even if it means pouring out all of ourselves in order to ensure that unity happens, unity and uh, unity stays in the church and between individual believers and that the message of Christ gets out to all who are in great need of our uh, message of Jesus Christ. I just want you to think about this for a minute. If all of the time, and I'm not just talking about church now, if all the time that we uh, spent grumbling and complaining about anything in general, anything in general, was spent on meditating on God's word or sharing God's word, how much different would your life be? How much different would the people's lives around you be? It would be completely different. Our desire is to see, is to allow the world to see that we live differently than them. Grumbling and complaining doesn't need a place in our lives. We seek to glorify God in all of it. All of our lives, not just in church. We need to be a testimony that way. Jesus was a testimony that way. The man was going to a cross. And like a sheep led to a slaughter, he said nothing. He didn't say, this isn't fair, this is a bad decision. He didn't say, this, this is something somebody else should do. I'm the creator of the world. He said, nope, in humble submission to the Father, I'm willing to do it. Even if it costs me everything. We need to be lights of the world, ladies and gentlemen. We need to be unifiers, not dividers. That applies to our lives, it applies to our church, it applies to our nation. Listen, if you don't know him today, my plea is that you would come to know him. Because he is the great unifier. In fact, he's a great rectifier. All of us have a sinful condition in our hearts. All of us have been tainted by sin. Original sin that came from Adam and Eve. When they first ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil after God had commanded them not to. And God sent a savior. And he says, listen, I'm a redeemer. I'm a rectifier. Your life is a wreck and I'm here to rectify it. But it takes humility to be united to Christ. Because ultimately it says, I am nothing, you are all. I trust you for my salvation. And the question is, have you done that today? Have you come to the place where you recognize that Jesus is who he says he is? That you need a sinner, or you need a savior because you're a sinner? Because if not, well, there's an eternity waiting for you, but it's not going to be pleasant. 
And church, listen, I don't know if this message applies to anyone. In fact, I said to the early service that um, I, this is the most unified church I've ever been in, honestly. Um, I don't know if this applies to anybody in here, but I do think it's a helpful reminder. I do really think it's a helpful reminder, especially, especially when your lead pastor is not here. Because there is always the temptation that somebody is going to get an idea from Satan. Well, I could do this better. Nope. Humble submission, humble obedience to our leader, humble obedience ultimately to our God. That's what's required. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this church. God, I can't think of a sweeter church that I've ever been in, honestly. I, the people love you. They desire a relationship with you. And they're willing to hear hard messages, willing to self-examine and willing to give of self to see the lost come to Christ. God, I pray that as we're reflecting during this time, that if there is anything in our hearts that we need to repent of, that that would be done. Lord, if there's anything that we need to work on, that you would give us the means to be able to do that. God, if there is anything that is keeping us from being able to be even more unified for you and, and expanding the kingdom even more rapidly, which is our desire to, to join you, to go for the prize, to be unified for the prize, to see people come to Christ and to see you glorified, I pray that you will remove all of those barriers to unity and you will unify us uh, and that we will be a beautiful bride prepared for Christ, that you will find us faithful. Lord, thank you for each of these people. Thank you for the ability to be here today just to be able to worship you. And I pray that in Christ's name, amen. All right, so last week you have to deal with me, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> thanks, Pastor Jeff. Next week you get to deal with Pastor Jeff. <laughs> um... Okay, we're actually finishing the series Humble Bragging Rights. I do want to make something clear. I've uh, had a couple of comments last week, and a couple of people have brought to my attention that some people think that there's some kind of coup going on at the church. And as I said during the service, sermon last week, that's definitely not the case. Um, we are united. We are uh, a great church that uh, loves one another. I just want to make it clear that uh, the only reason that we preach this particular passage is because that's what the Lord laid on my heart. It was the next uh, passage in the series, uh, Humble Bragging Rights. And today we're going to complete this series, Humble Bragging Rights, by looking at uh, Philippians chapter 3. So over the last few weeks, we talked about the humbleness of Christ, the reality that uh, through his humility, our salvation was bought. He was humble towards the Father, although equal with the Father, even though uh, he had all of the riches of heaven and everything that he could possibly desire, he gave it all up to be obedient to the Father and then ultimately to become a servant of all. And through being a servant of all, he became the lowest of low and died a death even death on a cross. And as we explored uh, two weeks ago, the reality of the cross was that that was the most heinous way to die during that period of time. It was humiliating. Jesus was stripped naked, treated as a common criminal, beaten, and suffered the full wrath of God on behalf of all those who would trust in him. So the creator ultimately become, became humiliated before all of creation. But then he was exalted above all. Last week we explored the importance of unity through humility. That we don't seek an, uh, selfish ambitions. That we pursue unity no matter the cost. We covered the importance of obedience to leaders. Whether they're present or not present. We also discussed the importance that we strive for unity. By avoiding discussing issues with other people that don't have anything to do with it. Go to the person that you have an issue with. And today we're going to wrap up this series, and I'm going to let you in on a little secret. There is something that you can brag about. Are you ready to hear what it is? It's the fact that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Through his accomplished work, you have been reconciled to the creator, the king of kings and lord of lords. That is what we can brag about. We can brag about nothing else out of our relationship with Christ. The eternal blessings of God flow to us now and all throughout eternity. That's what we get to brag about. 
That's what we get to brag about. Now, there are some people in churches today that believe that Christ's death was not enough. That there are certain attitudes, certain behaviors, certain things that you have to do in order to continue to be saved, whatever that means. My belief is, and and biblically it's the right belief, is that Christ either died for everything or he died for nothing. And so there is nothing else left to be accomplished in order for you and I to be acceptable to God because Christ has already accomplished that work. And today, as we're getting into Philippians chapter 3, we're going to be looking at a passage that deals specifically with these people who are called the Judaizers. And Judaizers are people who were Jewish that became Christians, sort of. They believed that in order to be a part of the family of God, that Gentiles, that is all those outside the Jewish faith, had to be circumcised. And I will leave that for you to explain to your own kids. <clears throat> and Paul is warning them, listen, there's nothing else to add to the gospel. And he points to the fact in Galatians, he's already dealt with this in Galatians, in the church in Galatia, um, that the Holy Spirit has fallen upon the Gentile people, and therefore they are already a part of God's family. That is the new circumcision. And so Paul's concern is that these people from Galatia, if they haven't already gotten to Philippi, they're on their way there. And he wants them to be aware that it is uh, crucial that they hang on to the gospel that he proclaims and not give in to these people who would confuse the gospel of works with the gospel of grace. So if you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, and if you don't, I hope you can look uh, on with somebody next to you or pull out a tablet and download the Bible app can read, uh, we're going to start in Philippians 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 today. So Philippians 3, verses 1 through 11. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. That took a really hard jolt to the left. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks that he has more reason for confidence in the the flesh than me, it is not so. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I gain, whatever I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered loss in all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Dear Heavenly Father, we do pray today that we will recognize the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power to save our very souls and the power to Give us the ability to continue to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the ends of the earth. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. The first thing I want you to, uh, to recognize before we go to our first point is this. Um, Paul writes that they are to what? Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And he says, it is no, uh, no, no uh, hardship for me to write this again. Because it's always important for us to recognize that no matter what the circumstances are that are going on around us, we can always rejoice in the Lord. If we lose our joy in the Lord, boy, we're in for a tough life. Joy in the Lord requires that we pursue that joy each and every day. And so he says, to write the same thing is no trouble. Now remember... Where's Paul at this point? He's in prison, right? Last week I said he's not in the, ho- he's not in the Hilton Hotel. 
He's in prison, not a nice, cushy prison, a Roman prison, right? And he's writing to the Philippians, Philippians, and he's saying, rejoice in the Lord, as though he is rejoicing in the Lord, even in the midst of all of his suffering and trials. And so he's encouraging them, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble, because he wants them to remember that above all other things, they can have joy in the Lord, regardless of the circumstances. And it's what? A safeguard. It's a safety for them. So it doesn't hurt to remind your brothers and sisters in Christ on Sunday, Wednesday, or all throughout the week. Hey, I hope you're rejoicing in the Lord today. Because that's what we have. And then all of a sudden, to verse 2, right? And verse 2 takes this ridiculous jolt to the left. First of all, he says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Period. Right? End of letter. Nope. Not the end of the letter. Paul's like, oh, and by the way, which is classic for Paul. And then he has like this ridiculously long sentence that just keeps going on and on and on. And he says, watch out or look out. Be aware of the dogs, evildoers, and those who who mutilate the flesh. So what we're entering into in this particular chapter is a Holy Spirit-inspired smackdown between Paul and the Judaizers. And so it's actually pretty cool. I mean, we would pay pay-per-view for this, right? I mean, we, this is something we would want to see. Like, oh, yo, Paul's about to, get, he's about to get his game on up here. And Paul says, you got to watch out for these people. And so the first point that I want to make today is that we can see that Paul has humble bragging rights in that he has a proud response. This is Paul's proud response. He says, look out for the dogs, look out for evildoers, and look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that if you disagree with somebody that you should go around and call them dogs and evildoers in these nasty kind of names. That's not at all what Paul's doing. In fact, uh, if we look at the Greek, we don't have a really good um, translation from the emphasis that Paul is placing on the acts of the people as opposed to the people themselves. And so I won't bore you with all the Greek stuff. That's exactly what you would be doing if that. (laughs) But the point is that uh, Paul is calling these particular Jews these, these names, but he's more concerned about the message that they're bringing. And there's a very serious um, kind of uh, attitude, kind of perspective that he brings to this particular paragraph. So he's not calling people names. He's simply identifying them for who they are. People who are on the side of Satan. Okay, and now you might first think that he's calling these people like pet dogs. Like we see dogs and we're like, oh, pet dog. You know, kids are naturally drawn to dogs and they want to pet them. Now, in Paul's time, that wasn't so. The majority of dogs aren't domesticated. We're thinking more like third world dogs that are roaming around in big packs and going through garbage and eating whatever they can find and dingoes that eat babies, all of these kinds of things, right? And so they see them as these horrific animals. And what's interesting is that as Paul was talking to the Gentiles here, he calls these Judaizers dogs, which is exactly what the Jews used to call anybody outside of their faith. And so we have to remember, Paul was Jewish and is Jewish, but he's been a convert to Christ. And so all of a sudden, those who he once called dogs... He now calls brothers and sisters part of the family of God. And he turns around and he says, now you are the dogs because you are working against God. And the emphasis that Paul wants us to see is that he is condemning the message that they bring. Where the Jews applied it to all of the Gentiles, he specifically points out these people. And why is he so serious about this? Well, Paul is extremely serious about the gospel for a reason. Because if we pollute the gospel, we undermine the work of Christ. 
Christ accomplished everything necessary for salvation on the cross. And to say we need to add something to it is to say to God, you know what? That wasn't enough. We put ourselves on the judgment seat and we say God might say this is enough, but it's really not quite enough. We have to do these things and we devalue the cross of Christ. We simply cannot stand at the cross of Christ and say, well, almost. Because that is not the reality of the cross of Christ. It said it is finished. There is nothing else for you and I to do in order to be saved. We only come to faith in Christ. And from our faith in Christ and a relationship with him, all of the good works flow out of there. Now, Paul says they're evildoers. We've kind of already touched on that. The reality is they're not working on behalf of God. Satan is trying to destroy the faith of the Gentile believers. But he also says, he goes on and says, those who mutilate the flesh. Now, he doesn't use the term circumcision. He says mutilates the flesh. In the context that we're in, where is Paul? Paul is in prison, but he's also in this Roman Empire where there is a lot of pagan worship. And in pagan worship, there's a lot of mutilating of the flesh useless mutilating of the flesh to those gods that don't exist now for paul he says look circumcision is just as useless as those who are mutilating the flesh in the temples of these pagan gods there is no reason for it you don't have to do it you're simply adding something that is unnecessary and let me let me ask you this If part of your response to coming to Christ required you to be circumcised as an adult, how many of us are going to come, right? What none of us are going to come to Christ like that, okay? And so Paul's like, listen, this is unnecessary, unnecessary. Christ either accomplished it all or he accomplished nothing. But there are people today who still believe things like this. I remember my dad telling me that when he was growing up, the movies were the most evil thing that you could do, go do. And so he would go to the, he went to the movies with his aunt and uncle, and he was crying through the whole thing because he was assured that, or he was sure that he was going to spend an eternity in hell because he went to the movies. Now, it changed when I was a kid because then my dad was like, if you go to one of those dances, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> what? 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 Things in themselves are not evil. It's what people do with them that makes them evil. There are other people who will tell you that you need to dress or act a certain way. You have to have a certain behavior. That your kids need to act a certain way. I've seen some of y'all's kids. You're in trouble. And you've seen my kids. I'm in trouble. But the reality is that none of that really matters. I mean, thank God that's not true because guess what? We would all still be condemned. We would all still be on our way to hell. Jesus fulfilled the law where we couldn't fulfill it because he had to, the, the law had to be fulfilled perfectly in order for us to enter into an eternity with a perfect and holy God. And he is the only one that can do it. Ain't nobody else on the judgment seat of God. Nobody else is going to judge us. God himself. Now, I don't want you to hear me saying, well, now I can just become a Christian and live however I want because that's not the reality. If your heart is not captured by love for God and a desire to do the things that he has called you to do after you have received the spirit, you're probably not saved because what that shows us is that you never actually received the spirit. You can repent all day, but not really care whether or not you please God with your life after that. That is not a biblical picture of salvation. A biblical picture of salvation says, I have come to Christ and now I give all to him. And I will live for him. And we see the fruit of our relationship with God and his presence of his spirit through our hope and devotion to Christ by pleasing him By seeing an inward change that ultimately comes through as an outward change to those around us who look at us every day. Now we all still fail. My parents will always say, oh, you're such a good dad. I'm like, yeah, you're not there on the bad days. 
My desire is to please Christ. But I fail a lot of the time. But Christ's blood covers that. What the, the reality of loving Christ and growing in him and moving towards him is that our trajectory is pointed towards Christ. That we are always striving and we're never like, meh, indifferent towards Christ. Christ paid it all. How can we possibly withhold anything from him? So the reality is that even those who are demanding others to live up to their standards, guess what? They're sinners too. And one of two things is happening. Number one, they're either insecure in their own salvation and thinking that they need to do something. Or number two, they believe that they have the right to tell other people how to live because they think they have it all figured out. Which is ultimately what? Oh, please, I don't want to have to go back and start the sermon series over again. It's ultimately pride, right? It's ultimately pride that says, I am better than you. I can tell you how to live. Well, no. You don't have it all figured out. You don't have it all figured out. And I really like something Paul says later on. He says, not that I have already achieved this. I mean, there's nobody in the Bible besides Jesus that has a more righteous record than Paul. He's like, I haven't even achieved this righteousness. And if somebody was allowed to judge, it would have been him. But he doesn't. Now, what I find is interesting, though, is that in order to counter, uh, counteract or, or contradict the uh, Judaizers, he lists seven different things. Seven different things that he does very proudly. Seven different things that he did in order to gain righteousness. Here we go. We're going to be looking at verse 4. Though I myself have confidence in i uh, have reason for confidence in the flesh if anyone thinks he has more reason for confidence in the flesh i have more circumcised on the eighth day okay check number one his parents were great great uh believers and they followed the law paul was circumcised on the eighth day he's of the people of israel so he's jewish fully jewish number three He is of the tribe of Benjamin. The very first king to come out of Israel came out of the tribe of Benjamin. We know him as Saul. He was a terrible king, but he was still the very first king. Very small tribe. And Benjamin was the uh, only other tribe to stay with Judah when the rest of the kingdom rebelled against King David. So we have a very, very strong appeal to his lineage And then he says, as to the law, a Pharisee. A Pharisee is a person who not only follows the law of God, but they have hundreds of other laws that they uh, forced upon others (laughs) because they were pretty uh, pharisaical. Yes. And if that's not a word, copyright. (laughs) Um. They made sure that other people also followed this law, right? And so he not only uh, followed the law, he went above and beyond. And as to zeal, what? He was a persecutor of the church. You see, when we have this intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Maccabees go in, they get rid of all these Hellenized Jews, which Hellenized Jews just means that they have a lot of Greek culture in them. They've kind of left Judaism. They took over the temple. The Maccabees come in. They go through eight crazy nights uh, of Hanukkah. And uh, they rid the Hellenized Jews out of the temple. They restore the glory of God to the temple, blah, 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 blah. And then these people from the Maccabees uh, see themselves as the real Jews. And so Paul is a part of this line that's like, we really believe. We are the true believers of Jerusalem. And so when this small cult of Christians comes up and says, Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Messiah. Paul sees himself in line with the true Jews who say, no. And so he starts persecuting the church as they would have persecuted any other people who would brought another message that would have polluted Judaism. I know that was a lot to take in, but listen, I'm running out of time and I'm still only on the first point. And then it says, as righteousness under the law, blameless. Now, you might look at that and be like, what is Paul saying? He's sinless? No, no, because remember, underneath, under the law, there was an ability for them to go to the temple to make atonement for sins. 
And so Paul sends, he kept on that uh, schedule of all of the uh, different festivals and sacrifices and all of these things. He says, I'm blameless according to the law. Of course, he's not sinless. He's just blameless according to what he thought would bring him righteousness, which was strict adherence to the law. Now, we look at this, and the people that he's uh, coming up against would say, well, then, if, if, or the Philippians would say, well, if you can't be saved by your righteousness, then who could possibly be saved? Does that remind you of another conversation somebody had with Jesus? He says, listen, listen, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees, who according to Paul, he was blameless, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples are like, what? Well, then who can enter the kingdom of heaven? Because they were the most religious people we knew. He said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So if anybody deserved heaven because of their righteousness, it was Paul. But we look in the very next sentence and he says, but whatever I gain, I had. Whatever gain I had, I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and that I may be found in him, not having an obedience of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through the faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. So here is Paul's humble response. Paul's humble response. He recognizes that no one else can measure up to the credentials that Jesus Christ had. That regardless of how well Paul thought he did, how much he had to brag about, how much high status in society he had, he was still a sinner in need of a savior. That in the scheme of things, all of his righteous works, all of the things that he thought he could uh, do for God were filthy rags compared to what Christ had done. Which is the reality of every single one of us. You go out and you ask a belie- uh, somebody who's not yet a believer why God should let them into, your heaven, they'll, or into heaven and they'll say, because I'm a good person. There are a lot of good people in hell. Because unless somebody can say, I'm a perfect person, that person is not entering the kingdom of God. According to Paul, he would be a perfect example of somebody that God should let into heaven. But he recognizes that even his own credentials are not good enough to get into heaven. And you have to think, when Paul is saying, I gave up everything, we're thinking like status as a Pharisee. We're thinking the accolades that come with that. We're thinking the fact that he probably had quite a significant following of people. uh, Probably a lot of money. And now he's come to the point where he recognizes that Jesus Christ is all in all. He has filled uh, the he has come and fulfilled all of the law and the prophets. And now he sees all of that stuff as rubbish compared to what Christ is to him. But here's the thing. Before Paul's conversion, he persecuted the church, right? He thought he was doing the right thing. There are a lot of people in church who think they're doing the right thing that are full of pride and selfish ambition and don't even realize it. I'm talking about people who are ambitious about things, but guess what? Ambition doesn't equal godliness. Sometimes ambition is self-ambition, promotion of self. And so a person filled with pride and ambition can think they're doing the work of God. They can do some good in the kingdom of God, but oh, when they fall, they also do more horrific work than they did good. They are ultimately wolves in sheep's clothing. So unless a person comes to the point where they recognize, hey, everything is lost to me. I'm not in it for myself. And we will always be tainted by a desire to self-elevate. Always. Because that's in our nature. 
but God gives us grace in that, and we don't strive for that. We fight against that. That's the mark of a true Christian, a person who is in pursuit of knowing Christ. Paul says, listen, all of that other stuff was worthless, worthless. What? Compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, I think in this society especially, we undervalue the value of Jesus Christ. I mean, Paul says the surpassing worth, that everything, everything, not just his religious background and all this, but all of the world is lost compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, his Lord. So the question is, do we value Christ that way? Do we see all of the things in this world kind of uh, offset by the reality of knowing Christ? Did you know there is no greater happiness than knowing the creator of the universe, knowing your purpose and allowing and being in a relationship with him? He, through all of this relationship with Christ, pours out blessings upon us that we may know him more and more and more. Is our every aim to know Christ more and more? Or is it to get more and more stuff? You see, Jesus didn't give it all so that we could just give some of it. He gave all so that we could give all of it and to recognize that his surpassing worth is greater than whatever we can accumulate on this world, in this world. Jesus' surpassing worth is because of his righteousness. There is only one God who judges, and he judged God, he judged Jesus as perfect, worthy, and surpassing all other things. You see, you and I, I don't think we recognize this. I don't think we recognize the fact that we, through Jesus Christ, get to enter into a relationship with God himself. The one who holds all things together resides inside of us. The Spirit of God, when we accept Christ, comes to us, indwells in us, and in that, we get to commune with God in a way that even the Jews didn't get to. Why? Because the Jews got to commune with God in his presence as he was in the temple. But guess who's the temple now? Our bodies are the temple of God. Our bodies are the temple of God. Listen, it is a privilege for you to know God, for me to know God. It is because of Christ's humility and his righteousness that his worth surpasses all other things. And he lives in you. It's no wonder that Paul saw everything else in his life as rubbish. Listen, listen, you will never convince me otherwise that there is anything more valuable than Jesus Christ. You you can strip it all away. And I'll still have Christ. Right? You could kill this body, and I gain Christ. Only that in this life or in the next life, I get to please and worship God and know the surpassing knowledge of knowing him and him crucified. Listen, I hope that's your desire. May we never tire of contemplating the death and the uh, resurrection of Christ. May we never uh, stop contemplating the depths of humility of our Savior, his righteousness, And the fact that he died for you and for me, for sinners like us. How can we do anything but rejoice, worship, and be humbled before him? What is, what is, in Genesis, what is, what does God tell Adam? For you were from dust, and to dust you will return. You ever think about the reality That the God, the creator God, wants a relationship with us who were made from insignificant dust. Now, why are we significant to God? Because we're created in his likeness and his image. But we were made from dust. And now we get to know the power of his resurrection. You and I are not insignificant. You and I who are found in Christ know the power of his resurrection. 
but you and I don't deserve anything remotely close to what he's given us. How dare we not pursue a knowledge of Jesus Christ and loving him, in growing in him, in boasting in him, in sharing him with others, in becoming a servant of all and obeying God. It is because of this surpassing worth that Paul says the resurrection is what compels him to continue to suffer for Christ. We withhold nothing just as Paul withheld nothing. You see, he understands. He understands the depths God went to to rescue us. And let's contemplate the cross for a minute. As I think Paul would contemplate the cross. If Christ indeed died on your behalf, on my behalf, on the behalf of all those who will believe in him for salvation... Why do we give him so little? Here's Paul saying, only that I would know the power of his resurrection and would suffer and even die on his behalf. And we say, I don't want to give you 10% of my income because, well, I might need it for later on. And as Pastor Frank would say, you've done gone from preaching to meddling, Pastor Josh. I mean, how dare we sit back and we say, yeah, God, I'll give you this, but I'm not going to be obedient there because eh, I don't really trust you there. Do we, do we really comprehend what Christ did on our behalf? I don't think we do. I don't think we do. But here is Paul, and he says, listen, I'm humbled that you asked me to do anything. Humbled that I'm a persecutor of the church. He calls himself the least of the apostles. I am the least of the least. I am humble that you have been allowed, allowed me to do anything. So here am I. That should be our response every single time to Jesus Christ, regardless of what he says. Here is my life. You take it because you bought it with, uh, with your blood. You see, Paul knows that this life offers nothing, that the things that he once counted as righteousness and he was once proud of, he's no longer proud of, but he what boasts in Christ. And he is honored to serve. And then Paul has a humble response. I mean, a hopeful response. We already did humble response. Verse 11 says that by any means possible, I may attain resurrection from the dead. Paul's desire is to expend himself fully for the kingdom of God. He wants to know the power of his resurrection, be propelled forward in the power of his resurrection by sharing the gospel all throughout the ends of the earth. Now, this particular passage, it sounds like he's saying that by any means possible, I may be able to attain resurrection. But I don't want you to take may as like Paul is thinking that there's a possibility that he has to do something else to gain salvation. Because that's exactly what he's preaching against, right? The reality is Paul is so humble that he does not presume upon God's grace. Because a lot of people say, well, I'm saved, so you have to save me and I can live however I want. Paul's like, I'm saved, but I don't presume upon God's grace. I believe that he has saved me, but I don't understand the fullness of how God is going, how Christ has paid for all my sins, even the wretchedness of my own heart. And got me to this point where I can be saved, not because of my own works, but because of Christ, that I may be saved, me, myself, me, all of our faults and our failures, you, myself, that we may be saved, that we may experience the resurrection. Paul is hopeful in Christ, but he never says, you owe me this. This begs the question, how righteous are you? I guarantee every single one of us has something that we're like, yeah, I do pretty good there. So if God was to ask me, well, what little bit more do you need? You know, Jesus got most of it, but I need, I need something else. You could say, oh, here's my righteousness card. It doesn't matter how good you are. God will reject that. Christ did it all. Either Christ paid it all or he paid for nothing. You cannot add anything. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. You are not the judge. God is the ultimate judge who sits on the throne, who looks over the world with his uh, judging eyes. Not that he judges and then punishes immediately, but that he recognizes that there are people who are in rebellion against him and that all of the works, even of believers, is filthy rags compared to the surpassing worth of Christ. 
and that none of us are able to be saved by the law. If Paul couldn't be saved by the law, then who possibly could? Even our greatest works are not perfect enough for God to accept, to allow us into his perfect presence. So listen, there is only one perfect, righteous, and completed work of Christ that happened on the cross 2,000 years ago that, re- that guarantees the restoration of a relationship with God, period. Jesus said, listen, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also, or there you may also be, or whatever translation you have. The if is not modifying if I go. Jesus knew he was going. The if modifies if I make a place for you. But the only way that Jesus makes a place or prepares a place for us is by faith in him. Faith in his completed work. And so the question is, is there a place being prepared for you in heaven today? Or is that something you're not sure about? You ain't getting there by your own works. You're getting there by the accomplished work of Jesus Christ. And he receives you with open arms. Jesus can start building that house, that room, that mansion, whatever your version says. Right now, if you decide to trust in him. Prepared for you in all eternity. So as for those of you who are saved, are you living in this reality? Are you living in the reality that the spirit lives inside of you? That you are called to do something other than come on Sunday mornings? But that you're called to be a light of the world? Are you pursuing knowing the surpassing worth of Christ by feeding your soul with his word each day and by praying and and meditating upon his word? Are you desiring to take the word of the surpassing worth of Christ to all of your friends and neighbors and beyond? Are you to the point where you can say, though everything be taken from me, though you slay me, Lord, I am yours. I will trust and obey. It is you who is of surpassing worth because there is only one thing that will last, and that is Jesus Christ and his kingdom. This is all fading away. Jesus Christ is all there is. Paul's hopeful response is that he would join him in the resurrection. And you can know that for certain. By placing your faith in Jesus Christ, saying, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I don't deserve your forgiveness. But Lord, I am willing to let it all go. If you will forgive me and I will follow you, trust you. Lord, I look forward to the day that I see you face to face. There's going to be a lot of good people in hell because they thought they did good enough. Good enough isn't perfect. There's only one who is perfect and it's through him that salvation comes. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that by your grace you have poured out your love. You have poured out your spirit upon us. You have given us the opportunity to be able to come to you, to believe in you, to, uh, to be able to fellowship with you. But God, we have so much that we think we can brag about, and it might look good in the eyes of people around us, but in your eyes, they're still just filthy rags. For there is only one of surpassing worth that you have deemed acceptable, and it is through him that we are able to come to a saving faith. And God, I pray that if there's anybody here that's making that decision today, that you will impress upon their heart that desire. God, I pray that as we as believers, uh, hey, we get unfocused. I pray that you'll forgive us of that, that you'll help us to live for you, that you'll be glorified in it all. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen.